Okay, I think um, I'm going to start. Let me um, quickly recall last time um, we introduced a generalization of the filling function and um, more or less what this was. We started with a metric space. Then um, we supposed that there's a bigger space that contains x, okay? And then for a curve, a closed Lipschitz curve in, uh, in x, we defined the filling area of this curve in the bigger space. Why? Just as the smallest mass of an integral current, S, an integral two current in Y, whose boundary is exactly the current induced by C. Okay? So maybe I'm just going to call the current, so that's the integral one current induced by C, I'm going to call it TC. Okay? So, um, yes. Okay, so that means you're allowed to leave the space X, right? For example, if you think of, 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 of the following thing, so you take just this lattice, this one-dimensional uh, grid here in, in R2, right? So if you, we already saw that in geometric group theory, you have you know, the so-called Dean function, right? So if you just look at curves in here, you can't fill them. Okay. However, if you make your space bigger, right, if you embed this somewhere, for example, if you everywhere you put here, you could put like a cap, a half sphere in it, then suddenly you can fill. Okay. So, so that means you can have a lot of holes. If you use an I space Y, right, then uh, you will be able to fill. Okay. So, of course, you can do the same thing um, with this filling area function that we had to, let me just uh, remind you, from there we defined the so-called filling area function x and y, um, which basically looks at all curves of length at most r, and then, you know, takes the one that is worse to fill. Okay? So, of course, we can do the same thing now in principle we can do if we are just interested in, um, in filling by disks. Okay, so that would just then be you know, the same thing here, except that except taking an integral two current, you just take the area, the parameterized Hausdorff area of um, of a Lipschitz disk. So that means from the unit disk into y, whose restriction is c. Okay, so we already said. That well, because here you have many more choices, right? Integral currents than, rather than just Lipschitz maps. Well, in principle, this should be, you know, smaller. Um, sorry, sorry, I should uh, have a zero here. Uh, should have a zero here to, to, to show that this is a, uh, a different one. Okay, we only use disks. Okay, and um, so in principle, this, you know, you have fewer competitors, so this should be smaller. The only problem is that here we're taking a kind of a different measure um, than here. Here we have Hausdorff measure. Here it's mass of currents, and they're only, you know, they're only the same up to a constant. Okay, if you have a Riemannian manifold, for example, they're, they're, they're the same. Okay, because there's only, uh, yeah. Okay, so so this will not, um, yeah. This, of course, then we can define the filling area function with disks for x and y. Okay. And this is up to a constant is bigger or equal to this filling function up there. Okay. So now let's maybe just do one thing quickly because we will need this even if we're not even if we we're just interested in Riemannian manifolds and. Um, you know, just looking at fillings in the Riemannian manifold, we will still need what I'm doing. So, so even if you think so, oh, this guy's just doing 
more and more general things, no, actually, we'll, we'll need that. So you can ask yourself, if you're given a metric space X, you know, in which bigger metric space can you fill the best? Okay. So the best is actually a Banach space L infinity. Okay. So for given X, for X, okay, given, we let L infinity of X, little L infinity of X, just be the, the space of all bounded functions on X. Oops, that's sorry. Bounded. Okay, no measurability or anything, of course, um, with the supremum norm. norm. Okay. So then, this gives you a Banach space, clearly, okay, and you can embed x isometrically in there. Okay, so you can view it as a subset, and this is by the so-called uh, Kuratowski embedding. So how do you embed? So first, fix a point, okay, and embed. Define the map that goes from x into L infinity of x, okay, just using distance functions, okay. So, um, okay, you take an x, then you define, we need to define a bounded function, okay. Um, so our bounded function, let's take a y here in x, okay. So what we'd like to do is just taking this. Okay. So if x is bounded, then this gives you a bounded function, and you easily check that this is an isometric embedding. Okay. If x is non-bounded, we have to uh, try to make this bounded, and the way you do that is simply by subtracting something using the fixed the base point here. So this gives you a function, and you can check immediately that this is actually a uh, Isometric. That means it's distance preserving. Okay, so this is um, is an isometric embedding. Okay. So now this L infinity L infinity spaces like this have a very nice feature. Okay, and this is a non-trivial. It's not awfully hard to prove, but it's it's definitely a non-trivial fact. Um, so, a nice feature of any such uh, infinity. So, just here, I should maybe say, you know, x need not even be a metric space, right? I mean, you, 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 um, for, 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 for this construction here, right? You don't need a metric on there. Um, it's just for a set. Okay? So, a nice feature is the following. Um, whenever you have a Lipschitz map, from a set, um, from, a, from a metric space, um, into such an L infinity space, okay? Say this is lambda Lipschitz, okay? A sits in a bigger, it's for a sub subset of another metric space, okay? Then there exists a Lipschitz extension to hold of B, with the same constant. Okay. Exists a lambda Lipschitz extension of this thing here. Okay. So I will not I will not prove this. Um, so this you can uh, find um, in, in, in many books on, on, on Lipschitz extensions. Um, so but applied now to this, what does that mean now? Right? So we have this Kuratowski embedding which is isometric. And so now, if x sits in a bigger space y, that means we can, um, we can um, extend this isometric embedding to a one Lipschitz map from y into L infinity of x. Okay? So applied to what we have over there, that means there exists a one Lipschitz extension 
psi bar okay, from y now to um, L infinity of x in our setting beforehand, you know, where basically we had the x here and here we had the Kuratowski embedding, we have this, right? Okay. So as a direct consequence of this now, because one Lipschitz maps, of course, you know, they, they both don't increase mass and they don't increase Hausdorff, Hausdorff area, right? So that means that now for any curve, C, if you fill in X, if you fill in L infinity, then, you know, you can fill at least as good as in any other metric space that contains, um, that contains y, uh, X, right? So for any metric space, Y, that contains X, okay? And of course, the same thing, you know, you can also do with the Hausdorff area. Okay. So that is the best space you can fill in. Okay. So the best in the in the sense that you need least area, right? Okay. So now quickly we'll need that um, for, for 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 later. So if X is actually a finite dimensional space, finite dimensional norm space, sorry. So if V finite um, dimensional norm space, okay, then we can bet it linearly isometrically into little l infinity. Okay. So then we can go into little l infinity. So these are just the sequences, right? It's about all bounded sequences or, you know, in this notation up there, this would be little l uh, infinity of the natural numbers. Okay. So how do you do that? Well, um, basically what you, you do, you just choose, you choose a countable dense um, subset of the unit bool in, in the dual. Okay. So countable and dense, okay, that's still, uh, of course, <laughs> finite dimensional space, um, V star. So you have there a countable dense. Okay, and so um, you just take now V to the sequence xi n of V and you check immediately that this is a um, isometric bedding. Gives isometric and of course linear, right? Isometric linear. Okay. And little l infinity, since you know it is just little l infinity of n, it has exactly the same properties uh, as, as this thing here, because that was, you know, for every x and for any metric spaces a, b, that was correct. So um, this has, um, little l infinity has same feature, has same feature, of course. Oops, that's uh, just, has same features. Feature above. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So, um, Now, I'm going to state the theorem that I already announced a few times, um, and now we're going to prove it, okay? So, this is this theorem about if you have a bit better growth of the filling area function than in Euclidean space, then actually um, it has to be linear already, so quadratic drops down to linear. Um, so, you start with the geodesic space, and I'm going to state a, a, a more general version, right? Um, X a geodesic metric space, and suppose that, first of all, there exists a Y 
which is um, a Y, which is a metric space, say again, geodesic, complete. Okay, completeness we need in order to make sense, you know, to have uh, integral currency in there. Um, so with um, Y contains X, and such that Y is at finite distance, of x, so that means there exists a number such that any point in y is at most this number far away from a point in x, okay? And such that the filling area function taking curves in x and filling them in y, that this is at most growing quadratically, okay? So now whether you take, so this, you know, we know up to a constant, it's smaller or equal to the one when you take a zero, right? So that's actually a weaker condition <laughs> if I ask this, okay? So now, secondly, so here there's not, nothing about the constant, right? There's no, the constant doesn't matter, it can be 100,000, you know, it can be smaller or equal to 100,000 times r squared, okay? So now, suppose, furthermore, suppose, can you still read this? Is that not too far below? Okay. So suppose there exists, now comes to this optimal, this a bit lower than uh, Euclidean condition, there exists epsilon and R0, such that now the filling area function um, in X, now we're taking the best one, the smallest one that you can find, okay? Um, that this is bounded by something a little bit better than in Euclidean space. 1 minus epsilon over 4 p pi times r squared for all sufficiently large r, meaning bigger or equal to r0 for some r. Okay. So that means you, you, know, you don't need necessarily to have that in the space itself. You can go to the best space you want, so the smallest filling that you can find um, anywhere in the universe, okay? So then the conclusion is then X is gram of hyperbolic. And thus we have that filling area function even with disks is um, at most um, linear. Is the statement clear? So in particular, if you replace the L infinity of X by just by X, okay, then that's the statement that we have beforehand, okay? And if you, put, if you replace Y and L infinity of X just by X, then that's the first statement I gave um, um, about this term. Okay. So now this is a, a, a generalization or a strengthening of, of, of what we do, okay? Um, and even if you're just interested in this classical, classical case where you have X, and x as well here, you'll actually end up proving exactly the same thing. So that's why I stated right away like this. Okay, okay so um, I should make one remark. Okay, I should have made this all um, uh, already um, a little while ago. So if V is a two-dimensional normed space, There, you can, so let's just x, take x as a norm space, a two-dimensional, say, okay? And let omega v be an isoprometric region. So that means you solve the isoprometric uh, problem. Um, so that means, you know, for a given, for a given area, you try to find, uh, to, you try to find the one with smallest perimeter, right? Okay, so isoprometric region, Well, with respect to any Haar measure that you want, okay, you just choose a Lebesgue measure on there and or the Hausdorff measure and, you know, any, all other Haar measures, so translation variant measures uh, are going to be the same up to uh, a certain constant and, of course, that doesn't change the shape, right? Okay, so uh, isoprometric region. So then, 
the Hausdorff measure of this guy. Well, you know, you take an isoprometric uh, region, right? So then this is going to be equal to the isoprometric constant that you have in this space times the length squared of, of, of the, the perimeter, right? Okay. So what I claim is that the isoprometric constant in this space is bigger or equal to 4 pi. So the inequality shouldn't be the other way around. I just be don't be don't be confused. This just means that this is equal to a constant times this, but the isoprometric constant is bigger or equal than the Euclidean. Okay, so that in some sense it means when you want to fill in Euclidean uh, among all you know two um, two dimensional normed spaces in Euclidean uh, space, you can do it best in some sense, right? It's it's uh, you need the isoprometric constant is the best. So, of course, you, you, you think now, well, okay, this is a... I, actually, I don't want to go into that too much, okay, why this is true. Um, of course, you can say, well, this is a crucial point for this theorem, right? I mean, you know, so... Um, um, well, actually, I don't think so, okay? So, you could actually restate the theorem as follows. You say, okay, suppose we have a metric space where, on a large scale, we can fill a little bit better than in the worst normed space, right? Or in the best normed space, say. Okay? So if it's a little bit below that, then you become Grom of hyperbolic. Okay? So clearly any normed space, right? I mean, it's not Grom of hyperbolic. So, you know, among all the two-dimensional normed spaces, right? I mean, you can ne definitely not have a theorem that will give you Grom of hyperbolicity. So, so you just say, okay, I, I take, you know, even if this constant were different here, actually we would end up just having the same constant here, which would still be the best thing that you can expect because among all normal spaces you have this. Okay. Actually, the same thing is true for um, if you take, instead of the Hausdorff measure, you take the mass of, of the current induced by this. Okay. So also the mass of this current here will have bigger or equal to this times the, the length squared. Okay, so the minimum of the two um, is bigger or equal to that. Okay. So actually, one has more. So this is a result from convex geometry. Um, one has actually more. Okay. So suppose we embed V... Uh, linearly isometrically, um, or no, let me maybe uh, say the following. Um, so, if you take the filling area um, of V in little l infinity, to which we, you know, uh, were able to embed linearly isometrically of this curve here, then this is still bigger or equal to this. Okay? So this is actually the same as, um, so yeah, this is still bigger, is actually the same as this. Right? Either if you take zero, then it's going to be this, or otherwise it's going to be this. Okay. So you might think, so let, let me just illustrate um, this real quick in a picture. So you have here your two-dimensional normed plane, V, and we had it embedded in the best space to fill. Here you have your isoprometric region in your space. Okay? And now you're looking at fillings in L infinity. Okay? So this is your thing. Here you fill with, with either with disks or, or, or with... Um, um, or with currents, doesn't matter, okay? So if V, um, so suppose, you know, if we replaced V and L infinity by, you know, a two-dimensional Euclidean space and the Hilbert space, then it would be trivial, right? Because then we have the orthogonal projection, okay, which is one Lipschitz, okay? However, when you're in, um, just in normed spaces, 
you don't have, in general, such a projection anymore. Okay? You don't even have, so I should say there exists no, in general, no one Lipschitz projection. Okay? So you can't just argue saying, well, if I take a filling out in L infinity, then I can just project it down into, into, into V, okay? And then basically, you know, it's just, um, it covers the whole um, of this region. Uh, that doesn't work, okay? Um, so for the mass, okay, so we saw already, you know, that um, the mass for currents is, is um, lower semi-continuous, okay? You can show that there actually exists a projection, okay? Exists a projection, a linear projection, okay? Such that the mass is not increased, okay? Which, but it's not one Lipschitz, okay? It distorts lengths, but in, in once you go, yeah. So, which does not increase, not increase mass of two currents. Sorry? No, this is. No, so so yes, okay. This is this is completely general. So whenever you have a k-dimensional, so yes, the two, the two and the dimension two here, they have to be the same. So whenever you have um, a, a k-dimensional, suppose you have a k-dimensional here, okay, a space, k-dimensional norm space embedded into some other norm space, then you have a projection which um, does not increase the mass of, 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 of k currents. Okay? And this is a result um, due to Gromov. So this is uh, Gromov um, who gave this argument. And you can find it, for example, a, 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 an easy proof in a paper of Alvarez and Thompson. Thompson, um, on, it's, it's called something with volumes of normed spaces, I think. Of normed spaces. Okay. So that's a, that's a very nice paper where they describe all kinds of different um, um, measures on a normed space, like Haar measures, right? And the property, the property that, that they have, okay? So, Maybe quite surprisingly, okay. So, for 50 years or 60 years, probably now, okay, a similar thing for Hausdorff measure was not at all known, okay. So, there's actually still a big open question that asks well, if you take regions in a k dimensional normed uh, space and you know you have it embedded into another normed space, you know. Is the region, the flat region, is this the volume minimizer among all fillings that go outside? Okay. So are plane domains, are they um, Hausdorff, you know, are they minimizers for the Hausdorff measure? Okay, so big open question. Um, so that's called one of the Busemann Petty problems. asks, well, if you have a k-dimensional plane in a normed space, okay, are domains in V, are they Hausdorff k minimizers among all either, you know, disc-shaped or all, you know, K surfaces, K dimensional surfaces, surfaces with same boundary. Okay. So that's been a, a, a big open problem. I think it's still um, at least in all dimensions above uh, K, uh, above two, it's, it's completely open. Okay. So for K equals to two, it's so only very recently in 2012. Um, this is uh, the answer is yes. Yeah. 
is yes, this is a paper by Burago, Dima Burago and Ivanov uh, from 2012 in GAF. Okay. Um, so, so, so the answer there, there is yes. Okay. So, and you know, now, okay, this, what I want to say here, this uses actually, this uses their answer there. Okay. So when I proved my theorem, actually, there was no, you know, this was completely unknown yet, because that was four, four years earlier. Um, so, um, but then actually you can circumvent this problem here by introducing yet another measure, which is actually, you know, bigger or equal to the Hausdorff measure, where it's known that it is, you know, that it minimizes all those, right? And so if you have a better constant, then four over pi for um, the Hausdorff me measure, okay, so that was the Hausdorff measure here with the Hausdorff measure, okay, but, you know, the Hausdorff measure is bigger than this other measure, okay, then you get it for this other measure, for this other measure, you know, we know it, and then I could use this, okay, so, so, so what I'm going to present now is, you know, just using this answer, because then it's a little bit easier, okay, so... Okay, so this is still a, a, a big open problem, except in in, uh, in, in dimension two. Okay. Um, so, okay, um, are there any questions? Um, okay, now we are almost ready for the proof. We need one more ingredient, and this is a generalization of uh, Rademacher's theorem to, um, to Lipschitz maps into metric spaces, okay? We already saw that with Emanuele. Emanuele went, you know, from Rn into in the space of, 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 of Q tuples, right? Okay, so now we're going to go into an arbitrary metric space, okay? But there, you know, you, of course you, so um, this is called metric derivatives because it's more metric rather than really giving you a derivative. So we start with a Lipschitz map from an open set in Rm into an arbitrary metric space. Okay. So now, of course, you can't make sense, right, of... You can't make sense of this in this metric space, okay? Of course, you could say, well, that's what we would like, right, for, 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 for the directional derivative, say, okay? We would like to take a limit of that. But, of course, you know, if you have um, x just in a metric space, you know, that doesn't make sense, okay? You could, of course, say, well, okay, let's embed it into a, a normed space, okay? Then we can make sense of that. However, you know, if you take L infinity, you know, there, um, in general, you know, that does not exist to derivative, okay? So you can't pass to a limit. Um, in, in many apps. So actually the spaces where you can are called uh, normed spaces with the rado nicotine property and, you know, L infinity doesn't have that, okay? So the idea of Bend, this is now all due to, to Ben Kirchheim in, in the 90s. Um, I think the paper is in 94. The idea is to take just, you know, metric things, okay? So we, instead of looking at difference, we just look at the distances, okay? We would like to um, show that the, in a metric way, so distance-wise, this behaves like a derivative, okay? So now you can ask, well, uh, sorry, I have f and phi's all over the place, sorry. Okay? So now you can ask yourself, does this limit here, it's like a directional derivative, does this exist? So if it exists, we will call it the metric derivative of phi at the point x in direction v. Okay. So it's the metric derivative if limit exists. This is called the metric derivative. Okay. So Bend showed that, yes, this is actually at almost every x in your open set, this limit exists for every v, 
actually, and much more. Okay. Actually, this is then a semi-norm. Okay. And actually, even much better properties that we'll we'll see. Okay. Just maybe a quick remark. Okay. If x is equal to some R n, we have um, Rademacher's theorem, which tells you that you know this Lipschitz map then is differentiable almost everywhere in the classical Fréchet sense, and you know then clearly um, we have that the metric derivative at all of these points exists in every direction, and it is just the norm, the norm. So that's a Euclidean norm here um, of the um, of the image. So let me give you um, Bam's theorem. Okay, so if V is F is above, okay, then um, the metric derivative exists in almost. Um, uh, every point in all directions exists for almost every x and all v all directions. Furthermore, we have something much stronger. Sorry? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes, of course. I think I said it, didn't I? I hope at least I said it. Yes. Sorry. Otherwise, of course, that's it's complete nonsense. Okay. Actually, one can say much more. Namely, that locally, okay, in the in the in the right sense, locally the distances they behave almost like the metric derivative, you know, up to an error which only depends on the Euclidean uh, on, on 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 the Euclidean norm. Okay. So furthermore, there exists countably many compact sets. With the following property, such that firstly, they fill out almost everything of you. Okay. Secondly, the metric derivative exists at every point and in every direction of, of a given C, CI exists for all x in ci and for all v. Now comes the crucial property. For every epsilon and every i, there exists a radius depending on i on the set C, ci and epsilon. Such that now I look at the distance of for uh, such that for every such that for every x in C i the distance of phi x plus v phi x plus w is comparable to the metric derivative of v minus w in the sense that this is bounded by at most epsilon times the Euclidean distance between these two directions. Okay. For every v and w directions which are of norm, of Euclidean norm, small or equal to the r I epsilon, um, and such that at least one of the two, say x plus 
V is also in C I. Okay. So the picture Oops, okay, well, the first, the second part of the, of the thing will be much more important for us. Um, so, okay, so the, the, the thing is just, you have here a set um, C, CI, say, okay, and basically it says that for every point X in here, okay, if you go into two directions, so that's X plus V, X plus W, Okay, then the distance of the images, okay, is comparable to the metric derivative, you know, um, in the, you know, basically, right, in, um, in, this, in, 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 in this direction here, okay, plus an error, okay. So, um, yeah, um, give me, let me give a few con consequences of this. Or let's let's call it consequence. Maybe let me do it over here. Consequence. Okay. So the metric derivative at any point of a CI is a seminor. Okay. So this basically follows almost directly from this. Okay. You can check immediately that you know that um, this has to be a seminorm now. Okay. So m d phi x is semi-norm, so that just means it has all the properties of a norm, except that maybe certain vectors are zero, right? For every x in every ci, okay? Furthermore, just uh, quickly, if phi is by Lipschitz, for example, then it's a norm. Because then the metric derivative can never be in no direction can be zero, right? So that's uh, yeah. So that's a, a first, and then a second um, consequence, which we will uh, need is the following. So suppose x is in CI is such that m d phi x is actually a norm. Then for every um, then for every delta, okay, so now if this is a norm, right, what happens? So if this is a norm, okay, then well, you know, it's any two norms are comparable, right? So that means that this is comparable or this is comparable to this. Well, in particular, this is bounded by this norm up to a constant. So since I can make the constant here as small as I want, right? So that means epsilon times this, you know, can be, is much, much smaller than this. So that means then that this guy here is bounded by one plus a very small constant times this from above and then one minus a little constant uh, times this. So that means it's actually once you endow Rm with, a, um, with, with, with this norm here, right, then it becomes an almost isometry. That means it becomes a 1 plus uh, delta by Lipschitz map for every delta that you want. Okay? And the delta, you know, basically, um, so, yeah, I mean, that of course, this, the closer you go into, right, you, because you still have this condition that, you know, you have to be close in order to have that. Um, so for every delta, there exists an R, um, say R delta I. Well, it's so now maybe you know fix fix I. Well, let's let me maybe call that. No, let's do it like that. R um, I delta such that the map phi from C I a little ball around x of this radius r i delta. So now, together with this norm, the metric derivative norm, 
to x, this is 1 plus delta by Lipschitz. So the upshot of this is, I think, a very remarkable thing. That whenever you have a Lipschitz map, a, say a bi Lipschitz map, from a, an open set of Rm into a metric space, then in this metric space, you find pieces that are arbitrarily close to normed spaces or to at least, you know, to pieces in a normed space of dimension m, right? Okay, so that is, is actually, um, yeah, okay, and this is exactly uh, what, what we're going to use. Okay? So one should say one more thing, um, maybe one remark, I'll make it down here because I will not really go into that. So you can replace u, so u open can be replaced by um, u just measurable. Okay. So then of course you say, well, okay, the problem is, what is the problem if you just have measurable? Well, you can't even you know, go into the direction x plus r v, right? I mean, see, that doesn't even make sense anymore if u is just measurable, okay? Well, there's a trick how to circumvent that. Well, we can embed x into L infinity of x, okay? We already saw that once you have um, a map into here, a Lipschitz map, you can extend it. So that means if you have phi from a measurable set to x, you can extend it to a whole of Rm, you know, into L infinity of x. Okay. And then you have Kirchheim's theorem, and then well you just have to check that um, at every other or at, at a Lebesgue density point, so where you know your sets Cis you know are uh, are dense, are almost a whole you know, neighborhood around uh, around the point, there actually the metric derivative does not depend on the extension, okay? which kind of makes sense because you have only, you know, when you zoom in, you have only tiny holes whose size is much, much smaller than right the, 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 the distance. Um, and then, you know, you can just, if you hit the, a point where, you know, it's not defined, you can just move a tiny bit away. And since it's Lipschitz, it doesn't uh, make a big difference. So this you can actually replace just by a trick like this. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so now, let's prove our theorem. Okay. So we will not use this. We will only need this upshot here. Okay. So um, that is going to be the crucial um, thing. Um, just that we have pieces of normed spaces in our space, you know, that are... Um, and that's what we will need. Okay, so now we're going to prove the theorem or give at least an outline or sketch of the proof of this is the theorem about the, the 1 over 4 pi. Huh? Okay. So we assume by contradiction, so what do we have to show? We have to show that if the filling area function is small enough, then the space is chromo-hyperbolic. Okay. So assume, by contradiction, x is not chromo-hyperbolic. So we said that chromo-hyperbolicity, by a theorem that I stated by Gromov, is equivalent to having all asymptotic cones being metric trees. Okay. Remember, asymptotic cones just to you scale down, you scale down the metric, okay? you blow down the space, and you pass to a certain limit, and you know, uh, it says that x is chromo-hyperbolic if and only if every asymptotic cone is a, is a metric tree. Okay? So then by this theorem of Gromov, there exists an asymptotic cone, x omega, um, which is not not a metric tree. So this means that 
not if you take three points, okay? So whenever you have x geodesic, you know, all asymptotic cones will be geodesic as well. Okay, that's not hard. That's, 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 yeah. So that means not every, not every geodesic triangle, so three points together with three geodesics is, looks like a tripod. Okay, that, that, that means this. Okay. So from this you can, so there exists such a guy. Okay. And you can then check immediately, so that's, that's very easy. Okay. So there exists a closed Lipschitz curve. So there exists um, C1 to X omega Lipschitz, which is non-trivial, okay? Such that, now I'm gonna use the same notation as earlier today. TC is the integral one current, okay? That is induced by, by C, just by integration, right? So this is basically the push forward of now I interpret um, C as being parameterized on the interval 0 over 1. It's just this push forward. Okay? Such that this guy here is non-zero. Okay? So the, the basic has, it's, 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 so actually you can characterize metric trees as follows. You can characterize metric trees by saying a geodesic metric space is a metric tree if and only if for every integral current, integral one current, um, without boundary, um, we have that t has to be zero. Okay, so that's a, a, an easy characterization. Let me just see, uh, show you quickly, or well, just indicate how that works. So we said that we have one guy that is not a um, Um, it's not uh, a geodesic, uh, it's, not the met, uh, it's not the tripod, okay? So basically what you do, you, you just have to show, you know, that now this guy here, I take such a curve, which is not a, 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 a tripod, and I just need to uh, find a um, Lipschitz form, a Lipschitz 1 form that doesn't cancel out, right? Okay, so basically you just take here a function f, which is one here and then goes outside very quickly to zero, okay? These guys here are geodesics, so you take a distance function, so you have to have an f and a pi, right? A Lipschitz form, okay? And you just take pi, you take a distance function, say, from this point here, okay? And since this is a geodesic, you know, integration of the derivative of this will just give the derivative one, okay? And you just have to choose this neighborhood where f is non-zero, so small that this curve doesn't come inside here. But you'll find that because you have, you know, it's, 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 it's not a, uh, a tripod, okay? So that's, that's a very easy thing. Um, okay, so now we've seen that is basically because we know that the filling function is quadratic, you know, with respect to so that is um, because the filling area function of x in y is bound is, is, is at most quadratic, right? Um, so we showed, or at least gave an indication of the proof, that then any asymptotic cone has an honest quadratic isoprometric inequality. Okay, so that we had as a proposition um, at the end of, of, of Wednesday. Okay, so we know that, and we don't actually need the whole thing. We just need the existence of a two current, integral two current, in the asymptotic cone, whose boundary is this current that up there. Okay. So there exists, we even know that is one, you know, whose mass is at most quadratic in the mass of T. Okay. Um, so now, clearly, because T is non-zero, S can also not be zero. Okay. So that means that S is not equal to zero. Okay. So now we said that uh, integer rectifiable currents are basically just sums of integrations over by Lipschitz pieces. Right? So we had the representation theorem, which is basically like in, in Euclidean space, right? That uh, integer or integer rectifiable currents 
are just integration over countably H2 rectifiable sets. Okay? So that gives us that S is actually the sum of currents of the following form. Remember this, so for a theta i, these are L1 functions on certain subsets which are integer valued, okay, and the phi i's are by Lipschitz. Phi i's, there are by Lipschitz from subsets to R2 to X to the, to the asymptotic cone by Lipschitz. Okay. So this is basically just integration right, um, over, over the domain okay, times this function, and this is the push forward. Okay. So since S is not zero, well, there exists at least one guy here that is not zero. Right? Okay. Um, so that means we have now, we have now one map, a by Lipschitz map, so that means there exists phi from a certain subset of R2 to x omega, which is by Lipschitz, and with the two measure of the domain strictly between zero. So now we basically use just this upshot of, 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 of Ben's theorem. Okay? So we take a good point, you know, one of those in these CIs there, okay, a good point, we zoom in, and basically what we get is, you know, we get more and more of an isometric map once we take a norm. Okay? So um, the, the, the basic thing is the following. So you have your set here, your K, you take a good point, okay? And now what I do, so this is, is going to be a, one of those good points that you have. And now I take an isoparametric region, okay? So now I have, you know, I can use this as a norm space, which is basically or contained in the norm space R2, plus this norm, which is just MD uh, phi x, right? Okay? So now, I take an isoparametric region in here, the way I had, okay, and let me also fix, so, so now, you know, okay, not the whole set might be in there, right? Okay, so you can rescale this isoparametric region, make it smaller, and now let's choose just a partition in here. So that means just finitely many points on the boundary, okay? And now after rescaling more and more and more, you know, more and more of these points are extremely close to the set K, okay? So we know that this map now phi into its xw, x omega, is going to be 1 plus delta by Lipschitz with delta, you know, basically going to zero, okay? So that gives us then points in x omega, finitely many points, so a 1 plus delta by Lipschitz map from these finitely many points. But each of this point is, by definition, right, an equivalence class of a sequence of points in x. Okay? So basically, that means you get more and more points, you know, you get finitely many points in x, right, such that after rescaling, they're basically, the distances are exactly the same. Okay? So uh, let me maybe just note this as a, as a um, so let uh, me note uh, this down. So it follows basically that, um, let me maybe, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm putting a few steps together, but um, you'll be able to do it uh, by yourself. So there exists a norm. Um, let me um, maybe just, uh, because otherwise I'm, okay. So that's the Kirchheim's theorem. Um, so there exists a two-dimensional 
normed space. The, with the norm, um, with the following property. Um, so, if we take an isopermetric region, and gamma, a finite set in the boundary, um, so finite, and you take a delta bigger than zero, then um, there exists an R, arbitrary small, um, and there exists a um, by Lipschitz map, which goes from gamma together with the metric coming from the norm to now instead of x omega, I'll take x right away because we only have finitely many points, right? Always finitely many points. You know, you can do a comparison between the asymptotic cone and the space itself. And that's the rescaling, the blowing down, such that this guy here is. Um, 1 plus delta by Lipschitz. So that's basically what I explained, just, you know, putting all these, uh, um, these, these, these few steps together. So now we're, I'm just going to argue um, the rest, I'm just going to argue um, in, in, in pictures. So let me just draw a picture. So here is our space, our two-dimensional plane V. Here is our isoprometric region omega V. Um, so then we take a partition of the boundary. That's gamma. So then we have our um, map psi into now, this goes to x with the rescaled metric, and that's a 1 plus delta um, by Lipschitz map okay. of, of these uh, points in gamma. Okay. Now we would like to construct the curve, right? So, I mean, the, 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 the main, the main um, idea is now simply to say, okay, well, here we have an isoprometric region. Okay. So now this curve we can almost map to a curve in here. Simply by now we can construct a curve by just adding geodesics. So these are <coughs> geodesics. Okay. So that gives me a curve in this space here. We already know that, you know, that in X, for you no know, long curves, we can fill it in L infinity very, very well. Okay, R we can make very small. That means we you know. So here we can fill in L infinity of X R D. We can fill this extremely well. Okay, so we get to filling. Let me call this the current S. Okay. We can fill this curve. So let me maybe say this curve, let me call this maybe C. Okay. So this curve uh, uh, C, we have an M and S such that the mass of S is bounded by um, 1 minus epsilon over 4 pi times the length squared of C. Okay. So now, I want to transport this back into here. Right? Well, what I can try is I can try to say, well, okay, so here I have, you know, at least from these points, I have a, a 1 plus delta Lipschitz map. Let's extend it. Okay? The problem you have is that whenever you want to um, extend a Lipschitz map to a normed space of dimension k, okay, well, the Lipschitz constant will increase by a factor of square root of k. 
Okay, in general, that can happen. Okay, so here we can't actually extend this map back into V, okay, because it will increase the, the, the constant too much. Okay, but what we can do, we've already seen the trick over there. Okay, we can embed this linearly isometrically into little l infinity, and so now this map, the inverse of this map, we can extend it. Okay, we can extend it. So psi inverse, okay, which is first just defined on these points here, right? We can extend it as a map from this guy here to L infinity. And this is going to be 1 plus delta Lipschitz. Okay. So now we can transport this current S here simply by you know, this map. Okay? So what will this give? So this has boundary, you know, this curve. So we'll get something that doesn't quite fill. Okay, so this guy here is the push forward of S under this map. Okay? So this guy here, you know, is almost a filling. Okay? It's almost a filling. If you make this partition very small, you know, you can still fill this in without losing too much, okay? And you see what is the mass of this guy here. Well, the mass of this guy, because it's this 1 plus delta Lipschitz, so that means it's just at most uh, 1 plus delta squared times, you know, the mass of this, you know, which is basically this. But this guy here, this is smaller equal because it was a 1 plus delta Lipschitz map plus delta squared the um, perimeter squared of this guy here, right? So that means you have almost a filling, okay? Its mass is basically bounded by this guy here times this, and here you have a maybe a, a, a to the power of four, okay? And, you know, after filling a little bit in, you still get something that is better than one over four pi, but we already said in, in norm spaces, you know, it's just not true, okay? Okay, so that, um, um, yeah, so this you can complete to a proof um, rather easily, I think. Okay, so I think this, uh, let's stop here for, uh, and make maybe five minute break, eight minutes, let's make eight, like Emanuele, that's uh, fair, okay, if you have questions, yeah, and then we, 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 we look at the, at the other theorem, uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to prove the whole thing in the other theorem, but um, um, at least a few indications. Okay, um, I think I'll start again. Um, so, so now... Um, we'll shift gears completely. Um, so now I'd like to briefly give some indications on how to get um, with similar techniques using this result from last time, how one gets um, spaces where the filling function is not polynomial, not exactly polynomial. Okay. So um, what we want to now we're going to be a Riemanni manifold, okay? There will be nilpotent uh, Lie groups with a left invariant Riemanni metric. Um, they're going to be nilpotent of step two. So there exists G of step two, nilpotent. Um, endowed with a left invariant Riemanni metric, such that it's filling functions. So there you can, you know, there you can fill, um, fill inside the space, of course, okay? Such that this guy here, is not growing like uh, r to the alpha for any for any um, alpha uh, real number. Okay, so uh, just one, one thing. Okay, we can of course not take l infinity here, right? Okay, because w when you fill in l infinity, it's always quadratic. Okay, because it's a normed space. There you can basically, if you have a curve, you just take you know, all the straight lines to a point and that gives you quadratic filling. So, so I mean, there, don't mess with that. So, that, yeah, okay. Um, so, yes, let me just recall quickly what is, again, a step two nilpotent group. So we'll always have simply connected, connected, okay. So um, G is of step two. So now that's the preparations. Um, um, preps. Okay, so G of step two. Remember, G um, so has a, a Lie algebra. 
So basically, tangent space at zero at the identity plus the Lie bracket. Okay, and of step two means of step two means so you have the Lie algebra. Okay, now you take the subspace generated by the Lie brackets. Okay, so this is the subspace generated by the Lie brackets. Okay, so any v w the Lie bracket and you take linear combinations. Okay, so this has to be non-trivial for a step two, um, non-trivial, so a proper subspace but which is not zero. And then if you pass to one more step, if you now take, you know, um, if you now take an element of here and you take the Lie bracket with anything in, um, in the Lie algebra, then this becomes zero. Okay, that means of step two. Okay. For example, Euclidean space, you would already, here, you would be finished, right? Because the Lie bracket is just a billion, so, 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 yeah. Okay. So now, we'll denote this by W. Okay. This is a, a subspace now of G. And now, if you let, I'll just show you that the, 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 the Lie algebra has a very nice structure, actually. Okay. So now, let V be any complementary subspace. Let V be a subspace of G such that G is the direct sum of V plus W. Okay. So these are just now two uh, subspaces. Okay. So what can we deduce from this? Okay. So you can deduce, first of all, that you know, um, W, any element of W, bracket with a guy in V, or any guy in G, right, is, is going to give zero, okay? So we have V, W is equal to zero, but that means just a, yeah, zero space, subspace, and that's the same as W and W, of course, um, okay? And we have that the linear subspace created by linear combinations of elements in here, Lie brackets, this is exactly W, okay? So, and that means, in other words, and that's basically a, a definition, that G is a Carnot group. No, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is the whole thing, okay? Um, yes. Um, is the, is the whole thing because you know once so you know that this guy here right is generated by by by, by things in here okay but whenever you take a, a thing in W uh, the, the 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 bracket is anyway zero okay so you when you have an element in 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 in, the, in W right you cannot generate anything at all so since it is generated it has to be generated by the V's because the W's cannot generate anything okay so um, yeah. Okay, so a Carnot group is actually a, um, of step K, say, is basically a nilpotent group of step two, uh, of step K, such that, you know, your Lie algebra has a composition like this, but into K subspaces, okay? And so that the first subspace, you know, if you do this, then it generates the second and so on, okay? For step two, it's basically always the case. So, so that's um, that's uh, yeah. In higher steps, actually, there are th are are, are um, G's where you can't get the decomposition with these properties. Okay, but in step two, it's the world is is, is nice and easy. Okay, in this sense, in this sense. Sorry, uh, yeah. Mm. So now we would like to work with this space, right? Okay, which is a bit complicated, but fortunately, we have a, a two. Uh, very nice uh, things which come from, from the theory of, of, of Lie groups. Uh, so this is an um, important fact which they're not easy to prove at all. Okay, we'll just use them here. You can use them almost as a definition if you want. So first of all, okay, the exponential, the Lie exponential map from G for the Lie algebra to the space to G is a diffeomorphism. Okay. And 
this diffeomorphism lets us pull back the multiplication, okay, the multiplication in here into multiplication in here, okay, and we can actually determine um, um, precisely what the multiplication, the pullback multiplication is. This is the so-called Baker-Campbell-House uh, formula, and with the multiplication, which is v, now I term the, the multiplication star, v, v star is equal to v plus v, v prime, is v plus v prime plus one half the Lie bracket of v and v prime. Okay, so for v and v prime in the Lie algebra, okay, Together with this multiplication, this becomes an isomorphism, okay? Um, with um, exp um, becomes group isomorphism, group isomorphism, isomorphism. Okay. So this, basically that, the pullback multiplication in step two has this form, is uh, due to the so-called Baker Campbell Hauser formula. Okay. You have basically for any step k, you actually can you know determine what this is. This will be something like this, and then um, plus um, higher order terms. Okay, where you have more brackets in there. But you know, here since we have step two, everything else vanishes. Okay. So now this is. You know, we can instead of working here, we can basically just work in here in G, in little g, with this multiplication. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So now um, we said we endow G with a left invariant Riemann metric. Okay. So remember what we have to do. So we actually use again asymptotic codes. So we want to understand what is the large scale behavior okay, of, uh, of, of G okay, when we rescale the metric. Okay. So first, um, since any two left invariant Riemannian metrics are um, by Lipschitz, um, we can just use any that we want. And one of the good, uh, a good one is one where, remember, we had that G is V plus W. Okay, we can have one that it, where which it makes this, this is basically just an inner product, right, that you translate around in the, in the space, such that these two become orthogonal, okay? So, let G, or let, let me now take a distance, right, so Riemann metric gives rise to a distance, let D be left invariant, um, Riemann metric, um, such that at the origin, we have that V and W are orthogonal subspaces. Okay, that makes life a little bit. So now when you rescale the metric, okay, we'll actually um, soon see that certain curves will be important. Okay, so these are, these are called the horizontal curves. Um, before we do that, let me just uh, do one more construction which will play a big role. We can define Lie algebra homomorphisms or, you know, then via exp uh, um, um, group uh, homomorphism, um, define group homomorphism, delta r, so I'll always identify big G and little g, okay, by delta r of, so any element of G I can write as V plus W, so this scales the V by a factor of R and the W by a factor of R squared. Okay. So just remember we had the we had the first Heisenberg group, right? Which basically you get went into X direction, say uh, an amount of L, then you go went into the Y direction and you actually go up very steep. Okay? So then you know you go back. We said that basically just by going, you know. Um, a curve of length L will end it up at L squared, okay, in the Z direction, okay. So somehow this, you know, basically means when you scale 
you scale by a factor of r squared, right? So one over l squared, that would take you that back down to one. Okay, so in some sense, uh, this, this, uh, these two things are, uh, are related. Okay, so you can check immediately that with this multiplication, this is a group homomorphism. Okay, if you put an r here instead of an r square, you know, you would not get the group homomorphism. Okay, so check directly that this is a uh, group homomorphism. Okay, now um, we define special curves. These are called horizontal curves, and basically one in the Heisenberg group where we went into the x direction, then we went steep up into the y direction, y, z direction, okay? That will be a horizontal curve, okay? They, they play a big role because they govern the large-scale geometry of, 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 of our G, okay? So we define first a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle, okay? So this is basically just left translation of my first subspace phi here around in the group via, you know, this guy here. Okay, so left translation. Left translations of V. Okay, so this is a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle and it's called the horizontal bundle. Okay. So you can explicitly compute actually what at the point X, you know, what this subspace of the tangent space is. Okay, so you can compute, uh, compute directly just using this guy here. Um, so if I take at the point x in G, this is just all the v's plus one half Lie bracket of x and v, where v is in v. Okay, so this you can just do using this. Um, it's a one-line computation. Okay, so now um, a curve C to G, which I always identify with little g huh, as before. So say uh, piecewise C1 or just C1 is called horizontal. If at piecewise, at every point where it's defined, the derivative is, lies in this horizontal space. Oh, sorry, x should be c of t, of course, g for all t where this is defined. Okay. So these are special, uh, special curves, right? Okay. Um, so, let me just give an example quickly. So, or a, constru a, a very easy construction um, using, again, this multiplication or, you know, this guy here. So, example, whenever you start with a curve in V, we can lift it to a horizontal curve in G. So, let C1, okay, so that's for, you know, that is a curve in in V, say again piecewise C1, okay, and define C2 of T as the integral from 0 to T, one half times the integral, sorry, of the bracket of C1 of S with C1 prime of S ds. Okay. So then you can, if, so then just using this or more or less this, right? so if you calculate the derivative at the point um, t of, so then c, so this is, right, for every t this is an element of w now. Okay, because that's always in W. W is a subspace, so that gives you something there. So if I take C1 plus C2 now, this gives you a curve in G, okay, in V plus W. Okay? So then this is horizontal. 
clearly, because if I take the derivative, I get c1 prime plus the derivative of this, which is just one half this evaluated at t. Okay, so this is horizontal. Very nice. So for every curve, you know, we have uh, in v, we have a horizontal curve uh, in g. Okay, and clearly, um, and if I take the length with respect to this d0 metric of c, okay, this is simply just the length in v with the Euclidean metric, right, with the metric basically, you know, which fixes there of C1. Okay. So that gives us a means of creating curves and it gives us a means of, of, of uh, computing the length, uh, which is extremely uh, easy. Okay. Um, so now, please uh, interrupt me if you have questions. Um, okay, so now we'll define a so-called Carnot Carr Theodori um, Dori metric. So this is a new metric which is more adapted to the large scale, as we will see. Okay? So this is usually denoted by DC or DCC. Okay? So this is, can you, yeah, maybe let me write DCC because otherwise Z, C and zero, they look extremely uh, close in my bad handwriting. Um, so if you have any two for x and y in G, we can define now the D, the CC distance as instead of taking the infimum of lengths of curve, curves from x to y, we take only horizontal curves. Okay. So that's the infimum now of lengths with respect to the usual metric that we, uh, we had of C um, such that C is horizontal, piecewise C1, as always, horizontal, and joins X and Y. Okay. So already, you know, right away from the definition, because we take only horizontal curves, right? So this quantity for any X and Y is bigger or equal to the distance d0 of x and y, okay? Because the distance d0, right, um, that you get from a Riemann metric is just taking the infimum of lengths of curves, right? And so that, you know, so that we get uh, right away. So then we get that dcc x and y is always bigger or equal to d0 x and y, okay? So now we have, it's non-degenerate, so it's, it's non-zero if x and y are not the same, okay? Clearly, we have the triangle inequality simply because we take curves and only piecewise C1 curves, okay? So if you take three points, then you go first to the first and then the second, that's definitely, you know, um, you might have a shortcut. Um, so the only thing that we have to check, well, can we actually, you know, join any two points by such a horizontal curve, okay? That means, is this actually a metric if we want to show that, we have to show that we have a curve, a piecewise C1 curve um, um, be, be, be between any two points, okay? So, in step two again, this is, this, is, this is easy, okay? So, let's show this is a metric. So, in general, if you have a, a, a higher step group, this is actually, you know, is a, a very non-trivial um, um, uh, fact, uh, which goes back to Chowroshevsky, is that correct? Okay, uh, but in, in, in step two, you know, the world is much nicer, okay? So this is a metric. So if you want to show that this is finite, that means there exists such a thing. Um, so we can, of course, assume without loss of generality because, you know, left translates, right? Um, they, um, they preserve horizontal curves. So that means, you know, we can always assume that x is zero. Okay. So why we write as y1 plus y2, where y1 is in v and y2 is in, in, in w, okay? So now yw, uh, y2, well, w is the subspace generated by brackets. Okay? So that means we can write this as a linear combination 
of brackets of elements in V. So we have V1 bracket V1 prime plus and so on, say, you know, up to some uh, K, VK prime. Okay. So now, how do we reach from zero to this Y? Okay. Well, now that's relatively easy using this construction here. So first, I'm going to go up to Y2. So how do I get up to Y2? So from 0 to Y2. How do I get up there? Well, I take the curve that goes in V. Okay? I take the curve that goes from 0 in V, goes first to V1. Then I go to V2. Uh, so V1 prime, sorry. I go back um, in the V1 direction, but in the negative V1 direction. And so I have a parallel epiped like that. Okay. So now that's a curve. Let's call it C1 okay, in V. So that's all in V here. Okay. Just this parallelogram that you go there. So now if you lift this, okay, well, we know exactly what the lift looks like, right? It's just the integral of whatever. Right? And if you, you can just compute it, it's a, it's a trivial computation, that when you lift this, well, then you'll actually end up at, so lift, horizontal lift, lift C1 bar. Okay, oh, sorry. Now I was maybe a bit stupid to use C1, and I wanted to use C1, C2, and so on. But don't confuse that with C1 that we had before. Huh? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll keep C1. So C1, so um, bar is the horizontal lift, okay? starts at zero and ends at V1, V1 prime bracket. Okay, that's a trivial computation because first you go in this direction, okay, then the, 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 the bracket with itself, right, with the derivative is zero, and then once you end up, once you're, you're here, right, then you get something like V1 plus T V1 prime, is your curve. If you take the derivative, then you get v1 prime, and if you take the bracket, right, then basically, you know, the bracket is just with uh, v1 prime, okay? So then you just get this, okay? One half of this, and you compute, and it's trivial, okay? So then you end up there. So basically, what you do now in G, right, in G, you go here in the v direction, then once you go into the V1 direction, your horizontal lift will go up. Then when you go back, that nothing happens, but then you go ba basically back up, and after completing this loop, the C1 bar will be up here, which is just this bracket. Well, then you can go on, do the same thing with V2, okay? So then you go up, you go to the next point, you go up to the next point, and then after k such steps, right, concatenation of the c i bars will lead you up. So concatenation of c one bar until c k bar, okay, gives curve, gives horizontal curve from zero to um, y2. Okay. And now you just have to go in the direction. So now you just, you know, the last leg that you do, you just go in direction y, y1. Okay. And that bracket with y2 is zero, so the lift is going to be the same thing. Okay. So then plus um, the leg, you know, in direction, in direction y1 gives what you want, gives horizontal C from 0 to Y. And that means that the distance, the CC distance um, from 0 to Y is small or equal to this length of, of this C, which is small infinity.
Okay. So that gives you that. This, this is a very, uh, yeah. So actually, if you inspect this a bit closer, this argument, uh, so here actually, so you'll see something better. Okay. So a closer inspection um, gives you um, the following. Closer inspection gives you that if you take all the CC distances from point zero to Y, where now Y is in the one ball um, around zero, and um, so around zero of radius one with respect to the D zero metric, that this is finite. So basically, right, so what did we say? The, 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 the length of this guy here is actually the length of, of this curve just in V, right? Because we said always the horizontal lift has the same length as the curve in V. So basically here, you would just have, you know, two times the length of this, two times the length of this, this, and you, you add up, okay? But what is the sum, you know, here, how many terms do you need? Well, you basically only need, you know, uh, two times the dimension of V. Okay, so k is at the most two times v. Okay, so um, since your d zero metric, you know, is by Lipschitz on, you know, bounded balls, it's by Lipschitz to just a Euclidean metric. Okay, so that means you know basically uh, you can compare all these things just with Euclidean stuff. Okay, so that means then that actually you 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 get this. Okay, so that's that's uh, it basically almost comes from this. Plus the fact that locally, you know, your G with the D0 metric is just, um, is just um, Euclidean space, or by Lipschitz to Euclidean space. Okay, so now, why, why, why do I want this? Well, a direct consequence of this is the following. Um, so we already saw that the CC metric is bigger or equal to the zero metric. But now, this shows that this is actually bounded by L times the zero metric. Well, but that's not true. But once you add another L, then you're done. So this is trivial. Okay, where does that come from? Okay, well, what do you do? You have a point X. You have a point Y. Okay, so I would like to bound this distance by this. Okay. So you just take uh, d, d0 g desic. We're in a complete Riemannian manifold, so that exists, right? So this is a d, z, g, uh, and now you just um, cut this in pieces of length one. Okay. Now we said. This metric is left um, left translation invariant, right? So that means now that we can each one each of these guys here, we can we know the distance, right? Is bounded by l times uh, by l. Okay. So this distance here in the CC metric has distance smaller than l in the CC metric. So you have L, 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 okay, and then maybe you have a rest, okay, but that you can only also, you know, say that this is smaller or equal to L, okay, so you get this immediately, okay? So that is that. So what, why is this nice? Well, what does that say? In other words, in our definition that we had um, in the first lecture, this means that G, D0, Asymmetric space is quasi isometric to G with the DCC metric. Okay. So that might just means on a large scale it's by Lipschitz, right? So I mean, once you forget this, points that are further away from L from each other, right, or to L, they behave by Lipschitzly with a constant of L. Okay, so that means large scale it's by Lipschitz, okay? 
And so now, once you rescale the metrics, right, what happens if you rescale the metrics? Okay? If you rescale both by a factor of r, okay, then this term here is going to go to zero. Okay? So as you, you know, rescale more and more, these metrics are going to look by Lipschitz up to by Lipschitz uh, uh, homeomorphism, they, they look almost the same. Right? Okay? So that means actually their asymptotic cones are by Lipschitz. Okay? So the asymptotic cones, which I denote just by G D0 omega, okay, they're by Lipschitz, by Lipschitz to the asymptotic cone of this. Okay? Well, that doesn't help you anything, right? Why not? Well, we we would like to have this guy here, but okay, now we've just replaced it by Nasser asymptotic cone. No, it helps you something because actually one will show that the asymptotic cone of this is just itself. Okay? So why is that? Well, remember, we had this um, homomorphisms delta r, okay, which basically in the Lie algebra they rescale things, right? Okay. So note that you it's again a trivial computation, okay, that delta r, so if C is horizontal, horizontal curve in G, then um, the length in the D0 metric of now this homomorphism here composed so once you rescale in some sense this metric by this homomorphism okay so this is exactly r times um, the length d0 of c okay so this is simply because you know horizontal means you're in v right and the vectors in v they're scaled by r okay and the the w directions they would be scaled by r squared so there you can actually not say I mean you can still say something but it's just an inequality okay so but this just now tells us that the delta r once you pass to the cc metric okay is a homothety okay okay so that means so in the cc metric delta r of x and delta r of y this is just exactly r times the DCC metric of x and y. Okay. So this space is a little bit like, you know, um, yeah, okay. And now, if you rescale the metric, well, you know, then you have always the same space, right? Up, you know, just an isometric copy of the, of the same space. And since it's proper, right, since it's proper, that means now that G DCC any asymptotic cone is just the space itself. A little bit like a Euclidean space. Okay. So that means now we know at least that the asymptotic cone of this guy here is by Lipschitz to the CC guy. Okay. So actually one can show um, one can show that for any you know Carnot group of any step that every asymptotic cone is actually isometric to this guy. And this is a deep theorem of, of Ponsu. Okay. So one can actually show much more. But here, for step two and by Lipschitz, you know, it's extremely easy. Um, any questions? Okay. So, now we understand a little bit better the large-scale geometry of, um, of, 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 of our groups that we want to, uh, to know. So now we do a little construction. How you get, and that's also, I think, quite, quite useful, even though, I mean, also quite easy again. Um, so we do a construction, how to get from a step two group to another step two group. Okay. So we start again G of step two with Lie algebra as before. Something like this. Okay. So now I can construct a new step two group as follows. I take any subspace of W and I just 
quotient out the subspace. So then the Lie out, uh, the, 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 the Lie bracket, you know, once I quotient out everything, this becomes a Lie bracket on, you know, on the new thing, okay? And that gives me a new group, okay? So now, I'll just do it for one vector because that's what we need, okay? So let u be any element of w, say, of course, not zero, otherwise it doesn't uh, make too much sense, okay? Um, and define a new group, gu, okay, um, such that it's Lie algebra. That's the Lie algebra of gu, okay? But this is w, and you mod out, you know, the subspace subspace generated by this. I'm going to use this symbol for subspace generated. Okay, so this is ru, just one vector. You take one vector out, okay? So then, as I already said, you, with the Lie algebra um, on, on GU, which is basically just the quotient out of um, the subspace, this gives you, again, a Lie algebra of step two, okay? So and then, you know, with the multiplication that we defined, you know, that just gives you exactly a thing like this, okay? So then this is, again, step two, unless, of course, you know, U is already, W is already, you know, um, just only one dimensional, okay? So this is step two. G is step two. Unless W is one dimensional. So for the Heisenberg groups, that doesn't work, okay? Oh, well, of course it works, but you'll basically just then get, you'll just get R2, okay? So that's not, it's not really something uh, uh, very, very, very useful, okay? Okay, so you can, you can uh, uh, create lots of different things by using this, okay? And now, the crucial proposition um, that basically gives our non-polynomial growth um, is the following. The first, I'm, I'm just doing a joint proposition, even though, you know, there were, uh, the, the different parts were proofed um, maybe 11, 12, 13 years apart, okay? So they're due to different people. Okay, so um, G as above, G and U as above. So the first part is due to Olshansky and Sapir um, in 99 or 2000, I think. Uh, 99, I think. Okay, and a, 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 another proof was given by Robert Young in 2006 or seven or eight. I think it was 2006 probably, okay? So it says the following, if G has the filling area function um, at most quadratic, Then, if you look at, again, of course, with a, with a uh, left invariant Riemann metric, then the new group is bounded by R squared log R on a large scale. Okay. So you don't lose much from quadratic, you go to this. Okay. So now you com can complement it with the following, and um, yeah, so now, no, in the second part, oh, that's, uh, that's the part where I came in with the geometric measure theory argument um, in 2011. So maybe I should say, many people suspected, okay, and they even wrote so, that they, so these guys here wrote, we can prove this, we are unable to prove that it's actually again quadratic, okay? So it was expected, it was more or less expected that this, this should be again quadratic, okay? Um, so, however, it's not always quadratic. So now if, and I don't need anything about this, so this I don't need, it's again a completely new 
thing, it's just starting from there. So if u is such that u cannot be written as the bracket of two elements, v and v prime, for any v, v prime in, in, in v, okay? It's not simple, yes, okay? You can always write any u, right? You can, any u you can write as a sum of these things, okay? As a sum of these things, but in general you can't do this, okay? So then, you can't have quadratic. Okay. So actually you can't have quadratic even if you use higher topological things. Okay, so that this is, you know, that this is smaller, right, smaller or equal to, to, to the one with the zero, right, so that means it has to grow faster than quadratic, also this guy here, and once, you know, you can meet both of these conditions that you have this and this condition here, then you're done, okay, then you have what you want, you have non-polynomial. So maybe, let me just remark on the existence of such a U, okay, so this is um, actually very easy. Um, so, remarks, first one is that as soon as, whenever the dimension of, um, of W is bigger or equal to two times the dimension of V, um, there exists, then there exists u as in b. Well, why is that? Well, sorry? Uh, no, I think it is uh, bigger or equal, okay? So wh why is that? So, you know, you can just look at the following map, right? So v cross v goes to w, and v and v prime they go to this guy here, okay? So here you have a two, uh, uh, two, 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 two um, times dimension of v-dimensional space, right? So it's image, and because it's bilinear, it's image can only, you know, half dimension at most uh, two times the dimension of v, right? Okay, so now, okay, that's exactly why Ben asked the question, okay? But of course, you know, this actually, the image is a cone, Okay, so what you can do, you can actually take just, you know, the, 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 the boundary of the unit ball, say, um, in V, right, so that has now dimension of V minus 1, you know, and you can still generate everything like that because you can just, you know, take the scaling factor over there, okay. So that has dimension, image has dimension, has dimension, um, smaller or equal to 2 times, um, dimension of v minus 1, okay? And then that means there must be something in this thing if it has dimension bigger or equal to, one, uh, to this, okay? So that you get uh, right away, okay? So now, um, this thing here, okay? So what does that say, right? We already said the higher Heisenberg groups, they in principle, um, they, 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 they have a quadratic asymptomatic inequality, okay? The problem though is there that the, the dimension of the, of the vertical space, right, W is 1, so, okay, uh, however, there exists a construction exactly like in the, in, in the Heisenberg group, where you start with a, uh, so, you know, basically the way you go from H1 to Hn, you can do that with any step 2 group, okay, you can pass to a similar construction, okay, where basically, you know, the, 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 the v-space is just n copies of the v-space of here, okay? And the, um, and then the, uh, the, 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 the w-space, okay, it's just, again, the same w-space, okay? And um, so once you take, so we need one where the w-space has extremely high dimension, okay? Um, so, and these are the three nilpotent uh, groups. Okay, so there basically that free means that, you know, the, 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 the Lie bracket has as few relations as possible, OK? 
Okay? So for example, if you take the following, okay, you can uh, make a space as follows. You just take any vector space, say um, the basis, basis E1 until Ek. Okay? So now you have W, that's a definition now, um, has basis um, e i j, where i is smaller or bigger or equal to one, smaller than j, smaller or equal to k. Okay, so that has a lot bigger dimension, right, than the dimension k here. Okay, and now you just define the Lie bracket in such a way that e i e j gives you e i j. And that's called, so now, you know, this gives you a Lie bracket. And so the dimension of W is, 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 is very big, right? You can, yeah. And uh, so this guy, G, um, V plus W, okay, is called free. Free um, of step two. So now this doesn't satisfy this, okay? This you can actually show that it has, you know, a cubic filling function, okay? A little bit like in the Heisenberg group, a um, very, very similar argument, okay? So now, uh, but how do you pass? Now what you can do, you can do a little bit like going from H1 to H2. You can do the following. Now you take, one usually calls it the central product, okay? It's the, the one that has, um, that has um, G, let me call GZ, okay? It has, um, um, the, the V is going to be V plus V, and the W is going to be the same, okay? And the Lie bracket is just the sum of Lie brackets. So, and the Lie bracket... The Lie bracket of Z is the following. Well, any element here you can write as V1 plus V2, right, plus a W. So V1 plus V2 plus a W. And you have V1 prime plus V2 prime plus W prime, okay? So the Ws, they don't contribute anything to the Lie bracket, but you just take, so that's the Z, the Z, the Z guy, right, it's V1 v1 prime plus v2 v2 prime, okay? And that gives you a Lie bracket, okay? So it gives you a, 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 a new guy, okay? So if the k is big enough, you know, the dimension here is much, much bigger. It's basically, you know, uh, k, almost k squared, right? So then you get still 2k. And you can show, similarly to the, 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 the higher Heisenberg group, you can show that, so can show. So that's again all Olshanskis appear, the same paper. You can show that this guy here, the filling area function of G central product with itself is quadratic. Okay. A little bit, yeah. Okay. So then this has very big, you know, um, the very big dimension here. So you can achieve this. So that means there exists um, G and U satisfying um, satisfying um, both things of the theorem, of the proposition. Okay, so that is basically now. Okay, so um, now one would only has to have to prove uh, this, this proposition. Actually, the first one is, 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 is relatively easy. You can just do it in pictures, okay? The second one, you need to work a little bit more. I would actually need, um, probably, I have, yeah, I, I would need about, probably about 40 more minutes. So, um, uh, but my time is, oh, I'm already over limit uh, by a lot again. So, um, yes, maybe, let me just ask, I mean, who would be interested to have just, I mean, I could do in half an hour, I could just, you know, 
uh, talk a bit more. For those who, I mean, who would be interested, you can just say no and, you know, uh, I'll accept it. But those who are interested, you know, I'd be glad to, to, to just continue in, in, in half an hour or 20 minutes or whatever. And uh, if, if people are not, if, even if there's only one interested, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I can give it. So, so, um, so if someone is interested, uh, I'll be here in, in half an hour. You'll, you'll be interested. Okay, so we'll, we'll do it. Let's do it in half an hour. Is that okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, in half an hour. And then um, it's, it's very, actually very, the, at least the, the first one, you can do in 10 minutes with pictures and everyone will understand everything. Uh, the second one, we need the machinery that we, 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 we set up. So we're also ready for that. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for your attention. Um,